Yeah, I, I can see I can see it in in uh, my screen. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, so I would uh, start to say uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for uh, being part of this webinar. Uh, the uh, reason why uh, we set up this webinar is because we have uh, so many questions, and this is a very confusing time. So we try to um, help as much as possible uh, to clarify some uh, common now uh, words that uh, you have heard for um, the last uh, week or so. Um, this is a webinar uh, uh, that stands, and uh, this is something that I wanted to highlight uh, at the 23rd of March. Uh, 2020 because this is quite important as uh, it is possible that in a couple of hours this uh, presentation will be uh, out of date. Why? Because uh, we have a constant change and update. So um, bear with us, you know, this is the information we have so far, but then uh, we will be back uh, with an update version as soon as possible uh, to communicate with you effectively uh, so that you could be uh, informed. So um, I would just start uh, to say what is the coronavirus and COVID-19 is a new illness and this is a fact uh, lung so it's not a normal flu um, and uh, this is caused by a virus uh, oh. is part of the uh, coronavirus family. The virus is um, thought to be uh, natural that so it comes uh, from uh, animals and then it just uh, spill over and uh, go into a uh, human uh, so far we know that has been uh, uh, two passage through uh, animals, uh, then the virus changes uh, its nature and finally uh, infect humans. So it's spread by respiratory droplets. So when you talk, when you speak, um, there are some um, uh, droplets there, as, as um, I said, so there are little particles that uh, goes out from um, your mouth. And so this is uh, important um, to uh, bear in mind. Then once uh, touches faces and uh, then uh, this uh, again um, has uh, made the um, spreading of the condition easy. So uh, the time of exposure uh, to onset of the symptom is between um, two days or 14 days. This is also something that we review all the time. You know, as much as we have um, data from uh, other countries and uh, from this country, then uh, also these uh, numbers are reviewed. But so far, two to 14 days with an average of uh, five days. Um, this is actually um, uh, not so specific to uh, this specific virus. The management um, is more on the symptoms and then there are as well uh, treatment that are specific in, uh, in uh, uh, severe cases. However, there is no specific treatment for the COVID-19 so far, uh, although uh, massive uh, work uh, is, uh, is uh, on the way in every country. And uh, so this is a really big hope. For uh, um, uh, what are the symptoms of the COVID-19? Um, um, so they, how long do they stay home? Sorry, did I, sorry. The um, uh, COVID-19 affect lungs and the airways. Um, normally starts with a fever, dry cough, but uh, we know now that we uh, have uh, people that don't uh, get affected at all. Um, so uh, this is a little bit of a, a issue here because despite you are infected, um, you're very normal and you can infect others. And so that uh, is a really big issue. Um, so for uh, the uh, classical symptoms of the COVID-19, uh, uh, we know there is a high temperature, 37.8. Um, so uh, 
um, I would suggest to uh, go and buy uh, thermometers uh, just to be more uh, specific. But if you don't have it, then uh, you know the sensation to feeling hot, you know, um, touch yourself on the chest, on the back, and then uh, see if uh, you uh, feel the raise of the temperature. Um, there is as well associated with this uh, cough, so uh, this usually is a, a dry cough and um, it can, can last for a long time. If you have uh, someone who lives with you and experience these symptoms, we need to uh, follow NHS guidance. This is really, really important. So stay home and uh, self-isolate. To protect others, uh, then um, do not go to a uh, pharmacy, a uh, hospital, a uh, GP, but just stay home. So, but how long uh, ones have to stay home? If somebody has symptoms uh, similar as the one I just say, uh, you need to stay home for seven days. If you live with somebody uh, who experienced these symptoms, then it's 14 days for the reason I said before. And then if you are over 70 or long-term condition, pregnant uh, or weakened uh, immune system, then uh, it's 14 days. And uh, if you stay home um, uh, together, try to keep away, try to uh, be uh, distant to uh, each other as much as possible. Uh, people with ataxia can experience uh, a transitory worsening of ataxia. This is, is something that we know no, is not only uh, linked with uh, COVID-19. It's linked with uh, any other kind of infection. And we know that. Uh, and uh, that is why I always say to my patients to um, have a vaccine uh, for uh, the flu. Um, and similar uh, to this, you can have a worsening. Um, we would expect that uh, patients with ataxia then develop symptoms uh, from the COVID infection. The symptoms uh, of ataxia might get worse, uh, similar to uh, flu-like um, symptoms. But what is the social distancing? So you have seen here uh, many times uh, by now social distancing and um, how uh, people with uh, ataxia then can uh, can do this so um, self-distancing is avoiding contact with first of all with anyone who has uh, a flu-like uh, symptoms because it could be COVID-19 and um, there is also uh, one thing that is quite important to avoid unnecessary journey uh, on public transport uh, but in general as well, um, even in, uh, in with, with private car to get to a very, very minimum unless it's uh, not necessary. So uh, working from home, um, make sure that you talk to do your employer and to, uh, uh, to, to start to get set up uh, remotely. Um, avoiding uh, places that are crowded, they uh, have more possibility to uh, get infected. And also small gathering in uh, places that are uh, small. Um, avoid it as well, uh, friends and, um, and family gathering um, for a communication using phone and uh, emails, everything that is uh, keep you at a distance as well. Then uh, for uh, uh, what's about going for uh, exercises. So far, um, the government has said that uh, they, uh, everyone is uh, allowed to go out, but make sure that you maintain the two meters, six feet distancing to each other. This is quite important, again, for a uh, uh, possible spread of the condition. Um, and uh, one other question that came out very frequently uh, is uh, if, if somebody has ataxia, are these people more at risk to uh, be infected? and to uh, get ill with the COVID-19. So some groups of people have increased risk uh, and these are uh, uh, 
everyone so far this is the category they may change because the um, NHS England and, and um, the government uh, may issue more uh, guidelines on these categories. So the over 70 so far, the people that are pregnant, the people that have neurological condition, uh, including ataxia. And people that have ataxia, um, usually they don't have um, a weakened uh, immune system than anyone else, apart from some, like uh, ataxia telangiectasia, or uh, some people, for example, they have an uh, autoimmune ataxia, and then they're receiving uh, immune uh, su suppressant. So that is something that uh, needs to be uh, taken into account. So the advice of autoimmune ataxia treatment uh, with mycophenolate, and this is uh, something that um, we have been discussing with uh, Marius, um, is that to continue to take your treatment if you feel well. And uh, if you have an appointment for review for a blood test and you feel unwell with a new continuous cough, a shortness of breath or high temperature, then it should be uh, avoid uh, to go to the hospital and instead you should call the 111 for advice so don't stop any medication without uh, speaking with your specialist because this is uh, very important there are precautions that uh, people can uh, take so the people with the taxi should limit the face-to-face -face interaction and uh, follow strict social distancing. So this famous two meters, six feet, are very, very important. This um, uh, advice is now also for, uh, for other people, uh, and uh, this has been uh, repeated as well by the Prime Minister um, yesterday evening. So we recommended following the NHS and government precautions um, which will uh, be updated regularly, and this is the website. So look up, look up this space, and uh, regularly, and see um, what is the change. So um, the uh, high risk groups. So we talked before about the high risk groups and the vulnerable group. The NHS uh, stated that they will uh, contact people who are at particularly high risk. And so they contact people either by letters or uh, SMS. And so um, they will start sending guidance uh, from today. Um, the guidance are still not out. We expect that this is likely to uh, include, obviously, uh, people with um, uh, neurological conditions, but uh, then especially with those who have uh, additional comorbidity, other condition, diabetes or cardiac complication. And um, so it is likely that this advice will include a strategy that is called uh, shielding. And what is shielding? So um, this, is, uh, this is a very important that uh, people uh, are likely to include in this category uh, solid organ transplant recipients, so people that received um, uh, organ and transplants, some people with cancer, um, then uh, um, people that are in immunosuppression drugs, pregnant uh, women and also have heart disease, people with severe respiratory condition, asthma, a severe asthma, and cystic fibrosis or COPD. And uh, some people with rare diseases, uh, such as severe combined uh, immunodeficiency, and people with neurological condition and other comorbidity. So uh, pregnant women and uh, COVID-19, um, uh, the recommendation is that certainly, um, this is uh, a state in which uh, you need to be very much careful. For the Royal College of Obstetric, um, there is a particular carefulness in uh, women. They have more than 28 weeks pregnant. Um, and this is, a, is something that you need, to, if you are in this situation, then you need to be, uh, apply the uh, social distances extremely um, strictly, so minimizing a contact with others. Uh, 
pregnant women and uh, uh, as well cardiac complication who has also cardiac complication are considered to be high risk so they should uh, isolate uh, for 12 weeks and um, women should as well um, have uh, guidance on social distancing for all vulnerable people um, including the uh, pregnant women but we are going to hear more as i said um, later on uh, hopefully uh, this the new uh, guidance is going to come up uh, soon. So uh, again, uh, one question from our patients is, I live with someone with ataxia, uh, what should I do? So what shall uh, the carer do? What shall a partner do? So if you're caring for someone with ataxia, there are some simple steps. Uh, this is something that is very paramount to protect them and to reduce the risk at the current time to uh, uh, spread the, the conditions. And this is uh, something that we can do following very strict, very strict uh, hygiene rules. Washing the hands seems to be very effective. Soap seems to be very effective for uh, uh, killing the virus. Uh, the uh, hand wash is um, uh, more than sec 20 seconds um, and uh, covering your mouth uh, so you sneeze in a tissue and the tissue will be in immediately. Um, if you don't have a, a tissue, uh, use your sleeve, but you know, make sure that you have plenty of tissue. So planning uh, as well, it's very good. Um, and um, this is something that has been uh, reiterated uh, more and more and more uh, um, in all the communicate from the NHS, from the Prime Minister and so forth. Look after your own well-being and physical health uh, during this time. This is also very important for uh, uh, people that are uh, taking care of uh, patients with ataxia. One other uh, question that is uh, coming up frequently, self-isolation. What does it mean? So the uh, self-isolation is uh, stopping the face-to-face -face contact um, for a, a short period of time to protect others uh, and slow down the spread of the disease. The NHS uh, advice on isolation varies according to uh, different situation. Again, we are putting here uh, in these slides the uh, link for the NHS uh, website. So if uh, you have some uh, confusion, some um, that you are, this is not clear to you, go and visit this website. So the face-to-face contact um, you can still uh, it's, it's something to avoid as we said but then leads as well to uh, psychological as well uh, problems so uh, to avoid that phone people uh, connect with other people um, by uh, whatsapp emails uh, and uh, other ways then ask a friend and neighbor to or a delivery driver to be essential items you need like food or medicine so don't go and try not to uh, move from your house and then they should leave on your doorstep uh, for you uh, to collect staying up to date on coronavirus around the uk these are a very useful link uh, that you can visit and these are quite uh, helpful. So uh, this is um, my short presentation and um, we are very uh, now happy to uh, reply to the questions that you kindly uh, have sent. Okay, Paola, so I will ask you the questions. Um, one of them is, um, should people with ataxia self-isolate or is social distancing sufficient? So this is very much depend on uh, the patients. As I said, you know, uh, we need to distinguish um, uh, people at high risk and people in the vulnerable area. As I said, uh, more categories uh, we are going uh, to hear from uh, the um, 
NHS England, and so what categories uh, they are. And therefore, uh, we need to be clear uh, where the patient lies. For the high risk, they should receive a letter and uh, an SMS or uh, any other way that the GP can do to contact the patients. Um, and they will know if they are at high risk because of this letter is meant to uh, as well give uh, a suggestion uh, if they should be uh, isolated. And the isolation is for uh, 12 weeks. So they will know. In case they will not receive this letter, then please call the GP. And uh, if also the GP is not clear, then uh, we will be happy uh, to uh, answer. Obviously, call the uh, specialist that they are uh, uh, visiting and they are under. So it is more clarity where they stand and what they should do. So, Paolo, I, I have um, quite a history of chest problems. Um, so. Um, so I, I am actually trying to self-isolate as much as possible because I just yeah. think that prudence, that if I'm able to self-isolate, uh, then that would be better. So actually I am in the office, um, but I will, I will explain to everybody that we have closed the office. Um, so we, are, we have instituted a, a system where only one person every day comes in. And the only person, and the person who is coming in is somebody who doesn't need to use public transport. Either they can walk or they can come in their car. So there is no reason for them to have any interaction between their home and arriving here. And then we're instituting a kind of half hour cleanup procedure for everybody who comes in for each person who's on the rotor. So before I go home tonight, I will spend half an hour wiping my workstation and the photocopier and anywhere else I've been that other people will use so that there is no possibility of transmission between people who are coming into the office for a taxi in UK. So just to talk a minute or two about our other services, um, we had a volunteering project just about to launch, paid for by the lottery. Um, the lottery are very anxious that we should use the resource that they've given us, given we can't get the full-blown uh, volunteering project uh, off the ground just at this minute. Um, so uh, the lottery are very keen for us to use uh, the, their resource as peer support to the community at this time. Um, so what we are trying to do, but we don't know whether we will end up with the technology, is to extend the hours of the helpline, but we just don't know whether we're going to manage to do this. Um, so if we can, that will be great. Um, please um, don't call the office. It won't be the easiest way to get a reply. Um, please uh, email, um, and you can email if you haven't got uh, an, the address of who you want to write to. Uh, you can email me and I'll forward things. So that's smilman at ataxia.org.uk or you can email office at ataxia.org.uk if you don't know who you want to speak to. Um, the helpline is open as normal. That's one of the reasons why people are coming into the office to be able to divert it to the homes of people who are answering. So, they, so that is just the normal um, helpline number and there should be somebody on that helpline number um, from 10.30 to 2.30, Monday to Thursday, and we will try to extend that. Um, and we will let you know on the website or on social media. We have a, um, oh dear, um, I hope you can't see that on my screen. Um, uh, we have a, um, uh, I can't remember what I was saying, I've just lost my train of thought. Um, we are sending out an e-news tomorrow, so the latest um, updates will be on the e-news. Uh, and with regard to the lottery, we will be making various opportunities available 
for you to provide support to each other um, over the coming weeks. Um, so we're launching a buddying scheme um, so that you can be matched to somebody to talk to on a, a weekly basis if you want to help somebody keep their spirits up or if talking to somebody uh, would help you keep your spirits up. Um, and, uh, and, and we will pass on any information we can uh, as soon as possible to you. And uh, we're going to be um, designing a page on the website to deal specifically with this situation that you can go to, which will have all the links about the information we're beginning to get together, um, some frequently asked questions which we will display. And there will also be a link to Paola's presentation and also uh, links to uh, this webinar, which we are recording. Um, Paola, just may to go I, back to the may question. I, may, I, may I interrupt you, Sue? Yes, sorry, for, I have stopped, yes. Well, yeah, so uh, regarding uh, the presentation, uh, we will do um, as much as we can. We will uh, update uh, our presentation, because as I said at the beginning, this presentation will be uh, out of date, uh, undoubtedly, you know. Um, so we are going to do, uh, what we're going to do is uh, to have an ongoing update and then, you know, we can share it. And uh, we have as well um, said uh, Friday when there was a map with, uh, uh, Marius and um, as well as Ajit that you know they could as well uh, be involved and uh, update so you know there is a community of uh, the ataxia specialist doctor uh, that is uh, dedicated as well in inform uh, our patients and our community uh, of what's going on and I'm right in thinking that you're doing, and you and Marius are doing all your appointments by telephone at the moment. Yeah, so this is uh, something that um, uh, I anticipate one of the questions uh, that I uh, received. So uh, for uh, we decided uh, already last week to migrate all our face-to-face -face clinic to a telephone clinic. This is uh, obviously um, um, quite straightforward with the follow-up. Uh, it's not straightforward with the new patients. So we're going to talk to the new patients. However, if from the referrals, um, we need to see them urgently, something that is very rare, um, that is happen in uh, in uh, the taxia center, but in, then we are going to see them. But if it's um, somebody obviously who has been seen by other neurologists and it's only a question of diagnosis, and we can uh, talk to them and then reschedule again as a new patient. Because remember, if you have new pa you are if you are a new patient, you have an hour slot. If you have a follow up, you have half an hour slot. So um, we're going to uh, reschedule as a new patient again um, later on. Okay, uh, Paula, there's been a question. There's been a question over the chat. Um, the letter or the SMS for high risk patients is this UK wide or is it NHS England only? For what I for what I know is uh, UK wide. Okay, thank you. For what I know, but uh, I can be more precise. Okay, so, so um, there's a question, should people living in the same house as someone with a taxio keep a distance from each other? Yeah, so this is um, something that um, uh, the uh, social distancing, it seems to be now, <sighs> spreading more and more and more in uh, uh, the normal population. And so um, everyone uh, have to uh, change their behavior. You know, as uh, probably you heard yesterday that all the park were packed. 
and uh, this raises the questions of reinforcement, uh, reinforcing more strictly uh, the guidelines for uh, self distancing. And this is what you know all the other countries are in Europe are doing, and are already done. Um, to it seems to be working. Um, so that's uh, is something that also we we should adopt very seriously. Uh, okay, so um, Harriet Bonney, who is a former chair of Ataxia UK, a doctor and uh, the uh, moderator of our Health Unlocked forum, has something to say. Harriet. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about the the the, the, the SMS phone call um, situation. So it was said in Boris Johnson's address yesterday that this will go to the extra vulnerable people, and that that's high it. risk. So this is what they call it, high risk. Yeah, and so on the the, the 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 list of of of, of people who fall into that category on the government guidance doesn't include people with ataxia. So I don't, so, so, so is, so the, the, the people with the, so the people with ataxia that will get this notification, is that people with ataxia who have as well, one of the high risk factors that the government have said? This, this is correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. But this I is, think this is absolutely like correct. And and what um, uh, Harriet? Um, now we are waiting for uh, uh, the government and um, to uh, subdivide this uh, group of patients. So the group of patients will be, for what I know, uh, they will be uh, subdivided in low, moderate, and uh, high risk. And okay. depending on uh, how many comorbidity you have, then you will be uh, in the high risk, uh, moderate or low risk. This is what uh, is my understanding. So that is why I said that, you know, the presentation obviously, because we don't have this category, I base the presentation on the high risk and the vulnerable uh, group but this will change. Okay, the next question I've got is, how long is self-isolation likely to go on for? And I think that we understand from the government, uh, certainly in these letters that they're writing out, that it's going to be 12 weeks in the first instance. Um, and it depends yeah. whether yeah, we're as, as, as good as China at suppressing it to know whether, whether we'll be let out at the end of 12 weeks. Yeah, yeah so... This, uh, this is uh, also my understanding, so, and uh, 12 week uh, is um, in the first instance, um, and then uh, it obviously will depend on uh, the number of uh, people uh, who got the uh, condition and uh, how is the curve going. So uh, this is mainly uh, based on data. The next question says, we have a holiday booked in the UK very soon and can isolate there as well as at home and can stay in the car all the way. Does the advice against travel refer to this sort of travel too? Well, I think anybody who's seen the news um, this morning um, will know um, that actually uh, the government has made a particular uh, comment about uh, people who are traveling and uh, that they really shouldn't travel to holiday homes or anywhere else like that, um, partly because of the stress that they might place on uh, NHS resources at the other end um, and, um, and also because of the, the business of moving about the country because it's all very well. We don't have to... Uh, uh, get out of the car on the way, but you still want to fill the car up with petrol at some point. Um, and uh, you might still need provisions where you're going to. Um, so I think the government advice is, is please do not travel, stay in your place of abode. Um, 
this is a very difficult one and I'm sure that people are wrestling with this all over the country. Um, I am a key worker, but my child has a taxier. Should I still send my child to school? What's your advice, well, Carla? So this is a very, very difficult uh, one. And um, if uh, somebody has a choice, um, then uh, no, but uh, if uh, obviously being a, a key worker, it's uh, if they don't have choice, then it's uh, possibly um, going with the mask, for example. Or know that there is a massive amount of contradictory signals uh, to wear or not to wear the mask, to wear or not to wear uh, the gloves, and uh if there is any other solution uh obviously uh this is the only one and maybe uh having a mask and uh having the gloves uh for uh, for the child okay we've had another question in over the chat if a member of the household has a tax year and is expected to stay at home for 12 weeks does this apply to the rest of the household as well? So uh, I, I'm, I'm so sorry, just to complete the uh, previous uh, questions. So it also depends, and this is something that is very, very important to underline. It depends on uh, the type of ataxia, um, you know, because if uh, you have uh, additional pathology, you are automatically are uh, on the high risk category. So you, if you have cardiac or uh, asthma, uh, diabetes and chronic respiratory conditions and so forth, then you will get in the high risk. So, you know, if you have simply ataxia is uh, one thing, but you have ataxia and uh, comorbidities and additional conditions uh, independently if these conditions are due to uh, the ataxias um, because a genetic condition can manifest as well in a different way then you should uh, you know look for uh, for uh, isolated quindi so uh, but this is uh, i guess that is going to be uh, easy so uh, to because you're going to receive the letter or the SMS for the child. In case of doubt, I would uh, highly recommend to ask the GP. And if the GP is confused, ask again the specialist. Okay, so the other thing that I noticed you saying, Paola, uh, was to call NHS 111. Um, and I understand from people who have tried to do that, that it is practically impossible to get through. So on every occasion, uh, my recommendation would be to email rather than to try and call. You will get yeah. very frustrated yeah. if you're sitting on the end of a phone. Yeah, um, that's, that's is a very good advice, I think. Okay, so... Um, uh, somebody has written in, I'm a key worker and have a taxi, or should I isolate or continue to work? And I'm just checking that uh, I've got your advice right, um, Paula. So what you're saying is, if somebody has a taxi, unless they have uh, these other comorbidities, um, then they probably are, are all right to continue to work provided they engage in as much social distancing as they can. Correct. And also to try to do uh, as much as possible, for example, remotely. So if they can, uh, you know, remotely, um, if they can carry out the uh, work remotely, then this needs to be really explored uh, with the employer. And, uh, and social distances, very strict social distances. Um, now another one. Um, 
this is about the additional symptoms. So, you know, you were saying that if somebody has cardio plus ataxia, a cardiac uh, problem plus ataxia, um, then they should uh, adopt more extreme uh, isolation uh, strategies. Um, does cardiac include hypertension is the question. Uh, no, no. Not, uh, I, my, my interpretation is uh, not include, you know, uh, hypertension. Only if, especially if uh, well controlled. So on on that respect, uh, again, uh, there are some uh, drugs that has been seen maybe um, not very uh, good for uh, the COVID-19, um, but the, again, the suggestion is not to stop any medication um, and to discuss with the GP for the hypertension or uh, with a specialist uh, who initiate that treatment. Okay. Um... Somebody said, um, if a parent has ataxia, so they've got a diagnosis, and it's a genetic ataxia, but their children haven't been tested for the disease, so there is a risk that the children might have ataxia, should the children also be self-isolated or be tested for ataxia? When we refer to the ataxia, it means that uh, people that show symptoms, not people that has the gene and doesn't show symptoms. So I would say that uh, children who are not, um, uh, who are not affected, okay. don't show any symptoms, I would say that they should behave like other children. Um, if a member of the household has ataxia and is expected to stay at home for 12 weeks, does or should this apply to the rest of the household as well? No, but they should um, uh, follow uh, really uh, the distances, so, you know, the social distancing. Okay, um, so... Um, would you agree with me, um, Paola? So, in, in general, a, a social distance is very, very, uh, you know, strict social distance is irrelevant for uh, the majority. Again, there is this uh, immediate escalation on a high risk when you have the comorbidity. However, you know, we, we need to wait uh, exactly for uh, these other categories and see. Uh, what uh, the government uh, think about this. But on the other hand, to be, if you've got somebody caring for somebody with ataxia, they may have to get right up close to do the caring. So in which case, if a carer has to get right up close, then presumably they should uh, isolate as well, really, because if there is no alternative but for the carer to be close to the person with ataxia, then the best way of protecting the person with ataxia is for the carer to also isolate. Yeah, if they can. Yeah. Because obviously if they, they are uh, the only one and they cannot uh, ask neighbours to, uh, uh, to help for food and so forth, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's been some stuff in the press about anti-inflammatories possibly having a negative reaction with the COVID-19. Um, I don't know if you've seen that, but um, uh, there was at one point some advice went out saying avoid anti-inflammatories and take especially, paracetamol instead. Yeah, especially the ibuprofen. So is it your advice to people that they should avoid ibuprofen? So the ibuprofen, if you stay on uh, ibuprofen, you remain on ibuprofen and you again uh, talk to your uh, GP or who has initiated the uh, treatment. 
And if you have then uh, obviously started to have uh, fever, then uh, this is a very uh, difficult situation because uh, if you have the fever, it seems to be that um, the ibuprofen is working uh, not very good on uh, the respiratory system. So uh, to abate the uh, fever, then one should uh, start should, uh, the paracetamol. So okay. the paracetamol, but if the paracetamol is not working and uh, still we have a very, um, very severe uh, effect from the fever, then you know you should uh, go for the ibuprofen. Uh, somebody has asked if the trial in FA, I imagine they're talking about the nicotinamide trial, is likely to be delayed as a result of uh, this emergency. So, um, for um, patients who ask about the um, trial, rest assured that um, this is something that uh, they are not missing anything at the moment because the recruitment phase has stopped in the whole Europe. So it's not only the UK. And um, the uh, trials, uh, no trials are going to commence in this period for anything, not even for, for even other conditions. Um, and uh, only the trials, they are uh, very uh, relevant and really uh, related to uh, life or death. They are uh, being carried out now, are allowed to go on. All the other are going to, you know, we have a trial and uh, again, we have uh, swapped all the uh, visits in a telephone visit. So we are really serious and very, you know, determined to make sure that the safety of our patients is uh, really uh, top priority. We, we talked, um, I mean, obviously uh, trials being delayed are, are uh, an example of the pressure on the health services all over Europe. Uh, and uh, when we had our call with our medics on Friday, uh, so that's the consultants and uh, specialist nurse uh, from Sheffield, uh, we did find that Sheffield has already approached uh, Emma, who's a specialist nurse in, in, at the Sheffield clinic, and asked her to reassign to the wards. So she, um, very shortly, if not immediately, um, will be stopping being an ataxia specialist nurse and going and working on the wards. Uh, now, depending on how bad the situation gets, she also indicated to me uh, that it's possible that Marios will uh, also be uh, asked to go and, and work on the wards as a, as a general doctor rather than as a neurologist, unless there are any particular neurological emergencies. And in that instance, then of course his clinics will stop. But at the moment, uh, his clinics are continuing by phone and, and so are powerless. Um, so this, this is completely uh, correct also at the Taxia Center in London. And uh, I have no uh, clinical fellows anymore. All the clinical fellows have been redeployed in uh, uh, ICU, I have one clinical fellow uh, will go to intensive care and will do long shift in intensive care. And I have uh, another research fellow who will uh, work uh, at the National Hospital, but as a general uh, physician, because, you know, uh, more and more we're going to uh, see patients with uh, this condition. So they already have been uh, redeployed. Suzanne, who is uh, a brilliant uh, specialist nurse, is still with me 
um, holding the uh, telephone clinics. She has uh, one telephone clinic and she has as well face-to-face -face clinic that now uh, are migrated in the telephone clinic. Until when, we really don't know. So okay. we are pretty much on standby and you know nobody knows what the situation will evolve. So we, we, we really have to review day by day. Uh, we have another question on the chat, which is, does cardio include or mean cardiomyopathy in children with FA? So yeah. children with FA are particularly vulnerable if they have cardiomyopathy. That, yeah. Okay, lovely. Um, we're getting towards the end of um, the questions, but there's one here. Is there any information an individual can give to the people who may treat them for a COVID-19 infection? Will doctors treating people with COVID-19 see that they have ataxia on their medical notes? So if uh, uh, this person haven't received a letter from the GP uh, suggesting the, uh, strat the strategy they have to uh, follow, then uh, again, uh, it's very, very important to contact the GP and make sure that they know what kind of disease they, they have. And again, if they are not sure, then uh, contact their neurologist the specialist um, so that uh, everyone is very clear on what uh, kind of condition they have. This is a chronic uh, condition plus uh, the comorbidity if they have one. And so the treating doctor can uh, obviously uh, be aware of the underlying condition. Okay. Um, so there is a bit more, oh, so, fine, uh, sorry. Um, should I be worried about having my cats and dogs being outside and around the house? So I, I think this is a question about can cats and dogs bring it in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is something that uh, came out very, very, very frequent uh, in uh, in our community, and uh, the answer is no. So far, uh, um, there was no evidence that a cat and dog can uh, transmit uh, to the human the the virus. So somebody has written, um, uh, "Hi, Grace." Um, somebody has written, provided we are to be helped by the government for work payments at 80% throughout this period, can you provide? And I think, well, I don't know that she cares who provide, who's the you who can provide supporting evidence for work if we have to quarantine for longer. Um, but I'm sure it would be more uh, effective if a doctor provided it. Um, yeah. So, would you be able to provide information for people for their work, um, providing their your patients, uh, so yeah, that they so, can quarantine for longer? Yeah. So um, the GP should uh, know because they will send this letter, and um, they will know if they need or not the self isolation. And this could be per se be a document for uh, the use of uh, this purpose. Um, we need to remain that the only primary care can provide a sick notes, a sick certificate. So uh, this is not, uh, I'm afraid, us uh, as a tertiary uh, feral centers and a specialist but again the GP but again you know it should be quite easy and quite straightforward for them because they uh, you know they, their GP should know in which category uh, the patients uh, are and so they should know about uh, uh, self-isolation and uh, extension of the self-isolation for how long and so forth. So I, I think the other part of it is, 
um, that it's unlikely that an individual patient uh, will have it suggested to them that they should isolate for, for longer. It's likely to be the whole category of high risk people. So in other words, everybody will know that the high risk are quarantining for not 12 weeks, but 16. So, so uh, I imagine what you should do is hang on to that letter that tells you to quarantine for 12 weeks. And that will be your proof that you are in a high risk group. And then if the government extends that period, well, maybe they'll send another letter, but equally it will be a matter of public record that the people who are been asked to isolate for 12 weeks have now been asked to isolate for longer. So, so I would hang on to that letter. Um, the other thing is in passing, I think Ataxia UK would be very pleased to know especially in the early stages, whether anybody is getting a letter or not. You know, because if none of our patients have got letters and yet patients think from what Paula has said that you're in the high risk group, then there may be something to be done about the fact that our patients haven't had the letter or some clarification to be gained um, from NHS England. Another question, Say somebody has a catheter that needs changing. Um, is there a risk to them if, 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 because it, it happens on a regular basis? Is there a risk to them for the, for the nurse coming in to do that every so often? I mean, it has to happen, doesn't it? You can't not do it. It's, it's have to happen. It's have to happen. And, uh, should the nurse uh, who come in uh, should obviously uh, make sure to wash the hands so to follow all the possible uh, notes and all the possible strategies for uh, very strict hygiene so this is something that's you know to uh, avoid uh, to spread uh, the condition uh, to the patients and to the rest of the family. So we've heard that the World Health Organization has announced a large scale global clinical trial called Solidarity to identify any treatments that are used for other infections which might also be used for uh, coronavirus. Uh, enrolling, enrolling patients will be easy so even hospitals overwhelmed with cases could take part. Um, the hope is that this will Id eventually identify treatments that could reduce the length of time patients spend in hospital. Um, would people with ataxia qualify for this, do you think, Paola? If they are... Uh, trial? If, if they are uh, affected with the COVID-19, uh, why not? No, I mean, they need to be in hospital to be part of the trial and that the hospital must be participating if it has the uh, if, if it has the resources yeah um, it's, it's it's something that uh, it will depend obviously on the inclusion criteria but i know uh, if this hospital it's part of uh, the multicentric um, multicenter trials i don't think so why not but this is, depends pretty much on the treating physician. So if the treating physician, they will have a say because I'm sure that there will be criteria about the lung, about the respiration, about the fever, about you know, what is the state of the patients and so forth. So now a couple of questions related to uh, Ataxia UK. The government has done much to support small, medium-sized organisations and individuals during this pandemic. Has there been any indication of what they will do to support registered charities who provide support to the most vulnerable? At the moment, um, I can only see that the scheme to pay 80% of the salary of people who are laid off um, is the only one that's applying right across the board 
uh, to charities and um, businesses. Um, but that requires us to lay people off. Uh, and uh, unlike other charities, uh, we understand that there are some other charities that are packed up that are not running their helplines. Um, Mind has no mention of mental health during this crisis on their website, uh, although they are sending out odd tweets. Uh, but I have, and, and the specialist nurse in Sheffield said, um, well, I think Ataxia UK is amazing because all the other specialist nurses for all the other conditions, their charities have packed up. And I'm pleased to say that actually staff are at home and they are working. They are working remotely. We are having meetings like this. I can see Tony putting his thumb up. Um, they are having meetings like this via Zoom. Uh, and we intend to be redoubling our efforts. We are not going away. Uh, and we are here to support you as much uh, as we can during this terrible time. Um, and then some other bright spark wants to know the procedure for setting up a virtual meeting just like this one uh, for members of their support group, which is a, a wonderful initiative. Uh, now, um, and I, I suspect I know who sent the question as well. Um, so um, you can get a free Zoom account, but it's quite limiting. Um, but it does allow, I think, meetings of around 20 people for about 40 minutes. Uh, I was on one last night and the 40 minutes ran out. And so the person who was doing the hosting just sent another email out to everybody and we started up again. Um, so uh, I think it is possible for people to be able to use these sorts of resources. Um, I'm afraid Ataxia UK's paid for account is getting a hammering at the minute. We've got meetings uh, set up a lot. Uh, so, so I can't offer to turn it over to you. Um, uh, but um, if you were going to be doing a lot of support, um, and we would need to know what that was, uh, then it might be possible that we would be prepared to pay a fee for you. Um, for you to be able to do your support group on a uh, on a paid for uh, Zoom. Um, so if you want to uh, if, if you want to get in touch and let us know what sort of a program and we'll see if it's worthwhile, uh, we might set up, a, for example, a second Ataxia UK paid for account, which we could give you access to rather than our main account. Um, we, we'll find a way. Uh, and you will see uh, that James Atkins, um, who is our new um, volunteering in control project volunteering manager, has written to you all on the chat and said, simply email me on volunteering uh, at ataxia.org.uk. And if I can, um, James, I hope you're there because what I'm going to try and do is take you off mute and give you an opportunity to talk to the meeting. Uh, and as soon as you start to speak, uh, okay. then the screen should go to you. There you are. Say hello to everybody. Hello, everyone. So this was just a very quick one. So obviously I help support the branches and groups. So if you do need any support around the Zoom account or just staying in touch with your members, like we just said, just email me at volunteering at ataxia.org.uk and I'd be happy to help. Thank you. Lovely. So, so James is, um, setting, is now moving towards setting up. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Wave if you can. Yeah, okay, fine. So I'm carrying on talking, but I can still see James. Um, so um, what James is trying to do is to find ways to enable you to either be supported or support others from the comfort of your sitting room and your splendid isolation. Um, and so he will be looking for um, volunteers uh, to do that. Now, I think we're probably coming to a close, um, but um, I want to give Paola an opportunity to say anything else that she uh, would like to say. Are you still there, Paola? 
Yes, I am. Okay, yeah. is there anything else you want to say, Paola? Yeah, so uh, one message for me is watch this space because this is going to be updated and um, the uh, situation is constantly evolving. So it's, it is important to uh, keep this in mind. And if you have any doubts and if you have any questions, uh, please uh, get in touch with a helpline or uh, uh, obviously our patient uh, get in touch in the usual way, either uh, by Kelly or uh, uh, by Suzanne, our ataxia specialist nurse, and we can uh, reply to you um, and uh, yeah, uh, try to, to support you in uh, any way. Okay, so we're going to get to the point of signing off in just a second. Ah, oh, hang on a second. Uh, somebody called Lorraine has raised her hand and uh, I'm just going to unmute her so that she can speak. Lorraine, what do you want to say? Lorraine? Sorry, by accident I did that. Sorry, just, I hit the phone by accident. Apologies. Ah, okay, never mind. Nice to talk to you, Lorraine, anyway. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, apologies. So, um, so everybody, um, uh, we are about to sign off uh, and I have just unmuted you all so that you can all shout out a bye-bye to each other and feel like you're part of one community. Bye -bye. Shout! Bye, bye everyone! Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. Thank you Bye bye, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe. You come Bye bye, all of you. Please be safe. Oh. Thank you. Bye. Bye.